The Christian in the World 34. Why I am not a pacifist Read to a pacifist society in Oxford in 1940, this was published in an expanded edition of The Weight of Glory and Other Addresses, U.S. 1980, and then in Timeless at Heart, 1987. It is now in Compelling Reason, 1988. The question is whether to serve in the wars at the command of the civil society to which we belong is a wicked action, or an action morally indifferent, or an action morally obligatory. In asking how to decide this question, we are raising a much more general question. How do we decide what is good or evil? The usual answer is that we decide by conscience. But probably no one thinks now of conscience as a separate faculty, like one of the senses. Indeed, it cannot be so thought of. For an autonomous faculty like a sense cannot be argued with. You cannot argue a man into seeing green if he sees blue. But the conscience can be altered by argument. And if you did not think so, you would not have asked me to come and argue with you about the morality of obeying the civil law when it tells us to serve in the wars. Conscience, then, means the whole man engaged in a particular subject matter. But even in this sense, conscience still has two meanings. It can mean a. the pressure a man feels upon his will to do what he thinks is right, b. his judgment as to what the content of right and wrong are. In sense a, conscience is always to be followed. It is the sovereign of the universe, which, if it had power as it has right, would absolutely rule the world. It is not to be argued with, but obeyed, and even to question it is to incur guilt. But in sense B, it is a very different matter. People may be mistaken about wrong and right. Most people in some degree are mistaken. And by what means are mistakes in this field to be corrected? The most useful analogy here is that of reason, by which I do not mean some separate faculty, but, once more, the whole man judging, only judging this time not about good and evil, but about truth and falsehood. Now, any concrete train of reasoning involves three elements. Firstly, there is the reception of facts to reason about. These facts are received either from our own senses or from the report of other minds. That is, either experience or authority supplies us with our material. But each man's experience is so limited that the second source is the more usual. Of every hundred facts upon which to reason, ninety-nine depend on authority. Secondly, there is the direct, simple act of the mind perceiving self-evident truth, as when we see that if A and B both equal C, then they equal each other. This act I call intuition. Thirdly, there is an art or skill of arranging the facts so as to yield a series of such intuitions which, linked together, produce a proof of the truth or falsehood of the proposition we are considering. Thus, in a geometrical proof, each step is seen by intuition, and to fail to see it is not to be a bad geometrician, but an idiot. The skill comes in arranging the material into a series of intuitable steps. Failure to do this does not mean idiocy, but only lack of ingenuity or invention. Failure to follow it need not mean idiocy, but either inattention or defect of memory which forbids us to hold all the intuitions together. Now, all corrections of errors in reasoning is really correction of the first or the third element. The second, the intuitional element, cannot be corrected if it is wrong, nor supplied if it is lacking. You can give the man new facts. You can invent a simpler proof, that is, a simple concatenation of intuitable truths. But when you come to an absolute inability to see any one of the self-evident steps out of which the proof is built, then you can do nothing. No doubt this absolute inability is much rarer than we suppose. Every teacher knows that people are constantly protesting that they can't see some self-evident inference. But the supposed inability is usually a refusal to see, resulting either from some passion which wants not to see the truth in question, or else from sloth, which does not want to think at all. But when the inability is real, argument is at an end. You cannot produce rational intuition by argument, because argument depends upon rational intuition. A proof rests upon the unprovable, which has to be just seen. Hence, faulty intuition is incorrigible. 
it does not follow that it cannot be trained by practice in attention and in the mortification of disturbing passions, or corrupted by the opposite habits. But it is not amenable to correction by argument. Before leaving the subject of reason, I must point out that authority not only combines with experience to produce the raw material, the facts, but also has to be frequently used instead of reasoning itself as a method of getting conclusions. For example, few of us have followed the reasoning on which even ten percent of the truths we believe are based. We accept them on authority from the experts, and are wise to do so. For though we are thereby sometimes deceived, yet we should have to live like savages if we did not. And now, all three elements are found also in conscience. The facts, as before, come from experience and authority. I do not mean moral facts, but those facts about actions without holding which we could not raise moral questions at all, for we should not even be discussing pacifism if we did not know what war and killing meant, nor chastity if we had not yet learned what schoolmasters used to call the facts of life. Secondly, there are the pure intuitions of utterly simple good and evil as such. Third, there is the process of argument by which you arrange the intuitions so as to convince a man that a particular act is wrong or right. And finally, there is authority as a substitute for argument, telling a man of some wrong or right which he would not otherwise have discovered, and rightly accepted if the man has good reason to believe the authority wiser and better than himself. The main difference between reason and conscience is an alarming one. It is thus, that while the unarguable intuitions on which all depend are liable to be corrupted by passion when we are considering truth and falsehood, they are much more liable, they are almost certain to be corrupted when we are considering good and evil. For then we are concerned with some action to be here and now done or left undone by ourselves and we should not be considering that action at all unless we had some wish either to do or not to do it, so that in this sphere we are bribed from the very beginning. Hence the value of authority in checking, or even superseding, our own activity is much greater in this sphere than in that of reason. Hence, too, human beings must be trained in obedience to the moral intuitions almost before they have them, and years before they are rational enough to discuss them, or they will be corrupted before the time for discussion arrives. These basic moral intuitions are the only element in conscience which cannot be argued about. If there can be a difference of opinion which does not reveal one of the parties as a moral idiot, then it is not an intuition. They are the ultimate preferences of the will for love rather than hatred, and happiness rather than misery. There are people so corrupted as to have lost even these, just as there are people who can't see the simplest proof. But in the main, these can be said to be the voice of humanity as such, and they are unarguable. But here the trouble begins. People are constantly claiming this unarguable and unanswerable status for moral judgments which are not really intuitions at all, but remote consequences or particular applications of them eminently open to discussion, since the consequences may be illogically drawn or the application falsely made. Thus you may meet a temperance fanatic, who claims to have an unanswerable intuition that all strong drink is forbidden. Really, he can have nothing of the sort. The real intuition is that health and harmony are good. Then there is a generalization from facts to the effect that drunkenness produces disease and quarrelling and perhaps also, if the fanatic is Christian, the voice of authority, saying that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Then there is a conclusion that what can always be abused had better never be used at all, a conclusion eminently suited for discussion. Finally, there is the process whereby early associations, arrogance and the like, turn the remote conclusion into something which the man thinks unarguable because he does not wish to argue about it. This, then, is our first canon for moral decision. Conscience, in the A sense, the thing that moves us to do right, has absolute authority. But conscience, in the B sense, our judgment as to what is right, is a mixture of inarguable intuitions and highly arguable processes of reasoning or of submission to authority. And nothing is to be treated as an intuition unless it is such that no good man has ever dreamed of doubting. 
the man who just feels that total abstinence from drink or marriage is obligatory, is to be treated like the man who just feels sure that Henry VIII is not by Shakespeare, or that vaccination does no good. For a mere unargued conviction is in place only when we are dealing with the axiomatic, and these views are not axiomatic. I therefore begin by ruling out one pacifist position, which probably no one present holds, but which conceivably might be held, that of the man who claims to know on the ground of immediate intuition that all killing of human beings is, in all circumstances, an absolute evil. With the man who reaches the same result by reasoning or authority, I can argue. Of the man who claims not to reach it, but to start there, we can only say that he can have no such intuition as he claims. He is mistaking an opinion, or, more likely, a passion for an intuition. Of course, it would be rude to say this to him. To him we can only say that if he is not a moral idiot, then unfortunately the rest of the human race, including its best and wisest, are, and that argument across such a chasm is impossible. Having ruled out this extreme case, I return to inquire how we are to decide on a question of morals. We have seen that every moral judgment involves facts, intuition and reasoning, and, if we are wise enough to be humble, it will involve some regard for authority as well. Its strength depends on the strength of these four factors. Thus, if I find that the facts on which I am working are clear and little disputed, that the basic intuition is unmistakably an intuition, that the reasoning which connects this intuition with the particular judgment is strong, and that I am in agreement or, at worst, not in disagreement with authority, then I can trust my moral judgment with reasonable confidence. And if, in addition, I find little reason to suppose that any passion has secretly swayed my mind, this confidence is confirmed. If, on the other hand, I find the facts doubtful, the supposed intuition by no means obvious to all good men, the reasoning weak, and authority against me, then I ought to conclude that I am probably wrong. And if the conclusion which I have reached turns out also to flatter some strong passion of my own, then my suspicion should deepen into moral certainty. By moral certainty, I mean that degree of certainty proper to moral decisions, for mathematical certainty is not here to be looked for. I now apply these tests to the judgment, it is immoral to obey when the civil society of which I am a member commands me to serve in the wars. First, as to the fact. The main relevant fact admitted by all parties is that war is very disagreeable. The main contention urged as fact by pacifists would be that wars always do more harm than good. How is one to find out whether this is true? It belongs to a class of historical generalizations which involve a comparison between the actual consequences of some actual event and a consequence which might have followed if that event had not occurred. Wars do no good involves the proposition that if the Greeks had yielded to Xerxes and the Romans to Hannibal, the course of history ever since would have been perhaps better, but certainly no worse than it actually has been. That a Mediterranean world in which Carthaginian power succeeded Persian would have been at least as good and happy and as fruitful for all posterity as the actual Mediterranean world in which Roman power succeeded Greek. My point is not that such an opinion seems to me overwhelmingly improbable. My point is that both opinions are merely speculative. There is no conceivable way of convincing a man of either. Indeed, it is doubtful whether the whole conception of what would have happened, that is, of unrealized possibilities, is more than an imaginative technique for giving a vivid rhetorical account of what did happen. That wars do no good is then so far from being a fact that it hardly ranks as a historical opinion. Nor is the matter mended by saying modern wars. How are we to decide whether the total effect would have been better or worse if Europe had submitted to Germany in 1914? It is, of course, true that wars never do half the good which the leaders of the belligerents say they are going to do. Nothing ever does half the good. Perhaps nothing ever does half the evil which is expected of it. And that may be a sound argument for not pitching one's propaganda too high, but it is no argument against war. If a Germanized Europe in 1914 would have been an evil, then the war which prevented that evil was, so far, justified. 
To call it useless, because it did not also cure slums and unemployment, is like coming up to a man who has just succeeded in defending himself from a man-eating tiger and saying, It's no good, old chap. This hasn't really cured your rheumatism. On the test of the fact, then, I find the pacifist position weak. It seems to me that history is full of useful wars as well as of useless wars. If all that can be brought against the frequent appearance of utility is mere speculation about what could have happened, I am not converted. I turn next to the intuition. There is no question of discussion once we have found it. There is only the danger of mistaking for an intuition something which is really a conclusion and therefore needs argument. We want something which no good man has ever disputed. We are in search of platitude. The relevant intuition seems to be that love is good and hatred bad, or that helping is good and harming bad. We have next to consider whether reasoning leads us from this intuition to the pacifist conclusion or not. And the first thing I notice is that intuition can lead to no action until it is limited in some way or other. We cannot do simply good to simply man. You must do this or that good to this or that man. And if you do this good, you can't at the same time do that. And if you do it to these men, you can't also do it to those. Hence, from the outset, the law of beneficence involves not doing some good to some men at some times. Hence those rules, which, so far as I know, have never been doubted, as that we should help one we have promised to help rather than another, or a benefactor rather than one who has no special claims on us, or a compatriot more than a stranger, or a kinsman rather than a mere compatriot. And this, in fact, most often means helping A at the expense of B, who drowns while you pull A on board. And sooner or later it involves helping A by actually doing some degree of violence to B. But when B is up to mischief against A, you must either do nothing, which disobeys the intuition, or you must help one against the other. And certainly no one's conscience tells him to help B, the guilty. It remains, therefore, to help A. So far, I suppose, we all agree. If the argument is not to end in an anti-pacifist conclusion, one or other of two stopping places must be selected. You must either say that violence to be is lawful only if it stops short of killing, or else that killing of individuals is indeed lawful, but the mass killing of a war is not. As regards the first, I admit the general proposition that the lesser violence done to be is always preferable to the greater, provided that it is equally efficient in restraining him and equally good for everyone concerned, including B, whose claim is inferior to all the other claims involved, but not non-existent. But I do not therefore conclude that to kill B is always wrong. In some instances, for instance in a small, isolated community, death may be the only efficient method of restraint. In any community, its effect on the population, not simply as a deterrent through fear, but also as an expression of the moral importance of certain crimes, may be valuable. And as for B himself, I think a bad man is at least as likely to make a good end in the execution shed some weeks after the crime, as in the prison hospital twenty years later. I am not producing arguments to show that capital punishment is certainly right. I am only maintaining that it is not certainly wrong. It is a matter on which good men may legitimately differ. As regards the second, the position seems to be much clearer. It is arguable that a criminal can always be satisfactorily dealt with without the death penalty. It is certain that a whole nation cannot be prevented from taking what it wants except by war. It is almost equally certain that the absorption of certain societies by certain other societies is a greater evil. The doctrine that war is always a great evil seems to imply a materialist ethic, a belief that death and pain are the greatest evils. But I do not think they are. I think the suppression of a higher religion by a lower, or even a higher secular culture by a lower, a much greater evil. Nor am I greatly moved by the fact that many of the individuals we strike down in war are innocent. That seems, in a way, to make war not worse, but better. All men die, and most men miserably. That two soldiers on opposite sides, each believing his own country to be in the right, 
each at the moment when his selfishness is most in abeyance and his will to sacrifice in the ascendant, should kill each other in plain battle, seems to me by no means one of the most terrible things in this very terrible world. Of course, one of them, at least, must be mistaken. And, of course, war is a very great evil. But that is not the question. The question is whether war is the greatest evil in the world, so that any state of affairs which might result from submission is certainly preferable. And I do not see any really cogent arguments for that view. Another attempt to get a pacifist conclusion from the intuition is of a more political and calculating kind. If not the greatest evil, yet war is a great evil. Therefore, we should all like to remove it if we can. But every war leads to another war. The removal of war must therefore be attempted. We must increase by propaganda the number of pacifists in each nation until it becomes great enough to deter that nation from going to war. This seems to me wild work. Only liberal societies tolerate pacifists. In the liberal society, the number of pacifists will either be large enough to cripple the state as a belligerent or not. If not, you have done nothing. If it is large enough, then you have handed over the state which does tolerate pacifists to its totalitarian neighbor who does not. Pacifism of this kind is taking the straight road to a world in which there will be no pacifists. It may be asked whether, faint as the hope is of abolishing war by pacifism, there is any other hope. But the question belongs to a mode of thought which I find quite alien to me. It consists in assuming that the great permanent miseries in human life must be curable if only we can find the right cure. And it then proceeds by elimination and concludes that whatever is left, however unlikely to prove a cure, must nevertheless do so. Hence the fanaticism of Marxists, Freudians, Eugenists, Spiritualists, Douglasites, Federal Unionists, Vegetarians, and all the rest. But I have received no assurance that anything we can do will eradicate suffering. I think the best results are obtained by people who work quietly away at their objectives, such as the abolition of the slave trade, or prison reform, or factory acts, or tuberculosis, not by those who think they can achieve universal justice, or health, or peace. I think the art of life consists in tackling each immediate evil as well as we can, to avert or postpone one particular war by wise policy, or to render one particular campaign shorter by strength and skill, or less terrible by mercy to the conquered and the civilians, is more useful than all the proposals for universal peace that have ever been made. Just as the dentist who can stop one toothache has deserved better of humanity than all the men who think they have some scheme for producing a perfectly healthy race. I do not, therefore, find any very clear and cogent reason for inferring from the general principle of beneficence the conclusion that I must disobey if I am called on by lawful authority to be a soldier. I turn next to consider authority. Authority is either special or general and again either human or divine. The special human authority which rests on me in this matter is that of the society to which I belong. That society, by its declaration of war, has decided the issue against pacifism in this particular instance, and by its institutions and practice for centuries has decided against pacifism in general. If I am pacifist, I have Arthur and Alfred, Elizabeth and Cromwell, Walpole and Burke against me. I have my university, my school, and my parents against me. I have the literature of my country against me, and cannot even open my Beowulf, my Shakespeare, my Johnson, or my Wordsworth without being reproved. Now, of course, this authority of England is not final. But there is a difference between conclusive authority and authority of no weight at all. And men may differ as to the weight they would give the almost unanimous authority of England, I am not here concerned with assessing it, but merely with noting that whatever weight it has is against pacifism. And, of course, my duty to take that authority into account is increased by the fact that I am indebted to that society for my birth and my upbringing, for the education which has allowed me to become a pacifist, and the tolerant laws which allow me to remain one. So much for special human authority. The sentence of general human authority is equally clear. From the dawn of history down to the sinking of the Terrace Bay, 
the world echoes with the praise of righteous war. To be a pacifist, I must part company with Homer and Virgil, with Plato and Aristotle, with Zarathustra and the Bhagavad Gita, with Cicero and Montaigne, with Iceland and with Egypt. From this point of view, I am almost tempted to reply to the pacifist as Johnson replied to Goldsmith. Nay, sir, if you will not take the universal opinion of mankind, I have no more to say. I am aware that, though Hooker thought the general and perpetual voice of men is as the sentence of God himself, yet many who hear will give it little or no weight. This disregard of human authority may have two roots. It may spring from the belief that human history is a simple unilinear movement from worse to better, what is called a belief in progress, so that any given generation is always, in all respects, wiser than all previous generations. To those who believe thus, our ancestors are superseded, and there seems nothing improbable in the claim that the whole world was wrong until the day before yesterday, and now has suddenly become right. With such people I confess I cannot argue, for I do not share their basic assumption. Believers in progress rightly note that in the world of machines the new model supersedes the old. From this they falsely infer a similar kind of supersession in such things as virtue and wisdom. But human authority may be discounted on a quite different ground. It may be held, at least by a Christian pacifist, that the human race is fallen and corrupt, so that even the consent of great and wise human teachers and great nations, widely separated in time and place, affords no clue whatsoever to the good. If this contention is being made, we must then turn to our next head, that of divine authority. I shall consider divine authority only in terms of Christianity. Of the other civilized religions, I believe that only one, Buddhism, is genuinely pacifist. And anyway, I am not well enough informed about them to discuss them with profit. And when we turn to Christianity, we find pacifism based almost exclusively on certain of the sayings of our Lord himself. If those sayings do not establish the pacifist position, it is vain to try to base it on the general secularist judicat of Christendom as a whole. For when I see guidance there, I find authority on the whole against me. Looking at the statement, which is my immediate authority as an Anglican, the Thirty-Nine Articles, I find it laid down in black and white that it is lawful for Christian men, at the commandment of the magistrate, to wear weapons and serve in the wars. Dissenters may not accept this then I can refer them to the history of the Presbyterians, which is by no means pacifists. Papists may not accept this. Then I can refer them to the ruling of Thomas Aquinas that, even as princes lawfully defend their land by the sword against disturbance from within, so it belongs to them to defend it by the sword from enemies without. Or if you demand patristic authority, I give you St. Augustine. If Christian discipleship wholly reprobated war, then to those who sought the counsel of salvation in the gospel this answer would have been given first, that they should throw away their arms and withdraw themselves altogether from being soldiers. But what was really said to them was, Do violence to no man, and be content with your pay. When he bade them to be content with their due soldiers' pay, he forbade them not to be paid as soldiers. But of checking individual voices there would be no end. All bodies that claim to be churches that is, who claim apostolic succession and accept the creeds, have constantly blessed what they regarded as righteous arms. Doctors, bishops, and popes, including, I think, the present pope, Pius XII, have again and again discountenanced the pacifist position. Nor, I think, do we find a word about pacifism in the apostolic writings, which are older than the Gospels, and represent, if anything does, that original Christendom whereof the Gospels themselves are a product. The whole Christian case for pacifism rests, therefore, on certain dominical utterances, such as, Resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. I am now to deal with the Christian who says this is to be taken without qualification. I need not point out, for it has doubtless been pointed out to you before, that such a Christian is obliged to take all the other hard sayings of our Lord in the same way. For the man who has done so, 
who has on every occasion given to all who ask, and has finally given all he has to the poor, no one will fail to feel respect. With such a man I must suppose myself to be arguing. For who would deem worth answering that inconsistent person who takes our Lord's words a la rigueur when they dispense him from a possible obligation, and takes them with latitude when they demand that he should become a pauper? There are three ways of taking the command to turn the other cheek. One is the pacifist interpretation. It means what it says, and imposes a duty of non-resistance on all men in all circumstances. Another is the minimizing interpretation. It does not mean what it says, but is merely an orientally hyperbolical way of saying that you should put up with a lot and be placable. Both you and I agree in rejecting this view. The conflict is therefore between the pacifist interpretation and a third one, which I am now going to propound. I think the text means exactly what it says, but with an understood reservation in favour of those obviously exceptional cases which every hearer would naturally assume to be exceptions without being told. Or, to put the same thing in more logical language, I think the duty of non-resistance is here stated as regards injuries simpliciter, but without prejudice to anything we may have to allow later about injuries secundum quid. That is, in so far as the only relevant factors in the case are an injury to me by my neighbour and a desire on my part to retaliate, then I hold that Christianity commands the absolute mortification of that desire. No quarter whatever is given to the voice within us which says, He's done it to me, so I'll do the same to him. But the moment you introduce other factors, of course, the problem is altered. Does anyone suppose that our Lord's hearers understood him to mean that if a homicidal maniac, attempting to murder a third party, tried to knock me out of the way, I must stand aside and let him get his victim? I, at any rate, think it impossible they could have so understood him. I think it equally impossible that they supposed him to mean that the best way of bringing up a child was to let it hit its parents whenever it was in a temper, or, when it had grabbed at the jam, to give it the honey also. I think the meaning of the words was perfectly clear. In so far as you are simply an angry man who has been hurt, mortify your anger and do not hit back. Even one would have assumed that in so far as you are a magistrate struck by a private person, a parent struck by a child, a teacher by a scholar, a sane man by a lunatic, or a soldier by the public enemy, your duties may be very different. A different because they may be then other motives than egoistic retaliation for hitting back. Indeed, as the audience were private people in a disarmed nation, it seems unlikely that they would have ever supposed our Lord to be referring to war. A war was not what they would have been thinking of. The frictions of daily life among villagers were more likely to be in their minds. That is my chief reason for preferring this interpretation to yours. Any saying is to be taken in the sense it would naturally have borne in the time and place of utterance. But I also think that, so taken, it harmonizes better with St. John Baptist's words to the soldiers, and with the fact that one of the few persons whom our Lord praised without reservation was a Roman centurion. It also allows me to suppose that the New Testament is consistent with itself. St. Paul approves of the magistrate's use of the sword, Romans chapter 13, verse 4, and so does St. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. If our Lord's words are taken in that unqualified sense which the pacifist demands, we shall then be forced to the conclusion that Christ's true meaning, concealed from those who lived in the same time and spoke the same language, and whom he himself chose to be his messengers to the world, as well as from all their successors, has at last been discovered in our own time. I know there are people who will not find this sort of thing difficult to believe, just as there are people ready to maintain that the true meaning of Plato or Shakespeare oddly concealed from their contemporaries and immediate successors, has preserved its virginity for the daring embraces of one or two modern professors. But I cannot apply to divine matters a method of exegesis which I have already rejected with contempt in my profane studies. Any theory which bases itself on a supposed historical Jesus to be dug out of the Gospels and then set up in opposition to Christian teaching is suspect. There have been too many historical Jesuses, a liberal Jesus, a pneumatic Jesus, a Barthian Jesus, a Marxist Jesus. 
They are the cheap crop of each publisher's list, like the new Napoleons and new Queen Victorias. It is not to such phantoms that I look for my faith and my salvation. Christian authority, then, fails me in my search for pacifism. It remains to inquire whether, if I still remain a pacifist, I ought to suspect the secret influence of any passion. I hope you will not here misunderstand me. I do not intend to join in any of the jibes to which those of your persuasion are exposed in the popular press. Let me say at the outset that I think it unlikely there is anyone present less courageous than myself. But let me also say that there is no man alive so virtuous that he need feel himself insulted at being asked to consider the possibility of a warping passion, when the choice is one between so much happiness and so much misery. For let us make no mistake, all that we fear from all the kinds of adversity severally is collected together in the life of a soldier on active service. Like sickness, it threatens pain and death. Like poverty, it threatens ill lodging, cold, heat, thirst and hunger. Like slavery, it threatens toil, humiliation, injustice and arbitrary rule. Like exile, it separates you from all you love. Like the galleys, it imprisons you at close quarters with uncongenial companions. It threatens every temporal evil, every evil except dishonour and final perdition, and those who bear it like it no better than you would like it. On the other side, though it may not be your fault, it is certainly a fact that pacifism threatens you with almost nothing. Some public opprobrium, yes, from people whose opinion you discount and whose society you do not frequent, soon recompensed by the warm mutual approval which exists inevitably in any minority group. For the rest, it offers you a continuance of the life you know and love, among the people and in the surroundings you know and love. It offers you time to lay the foundations of a career, for whether you will or no, you can hardly help getting the jobs for which the discharged soldiers will one day look in vain. You do not even have to fear as pacifists may have had to fear in the last war, that public opinion will punish you when the peace comes. For we have learned now that though the world is slow to forgive, it is quick to forget. This, then, is why I am not a pacifist. If I tried to become one, I should find a very doubtful factual basis, an obscure train of reasoning, a weight of authority both human and divine against me and strong grounds for suspecting that my wishes had directed my decision. As I have said, moral decisions do not admit of mathematical certainty. It may be, after all, that pacifism is right. But it seems to me very long odds, longer odds than I would care to take with the voice of almost all humanity against me.